Um, we, uh, by now, we more or less know the routine, I guess, that if you, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, you can raise your hand at the end of the talk, or you can also just unmute yourself and uh, interrupt the talk if you find a, a good point to do so. So we move on to the first talk uh, by Justin Vines, who is going to tell us about binary black hole scattering. Hey, thanks, Paul. And thanks to the organizers for the chance to speak. Um, like several other talks, especially today, um, maybe also on other days in the conference, the context for um, what I'll be talking about is a bit different from the usual context of amplitudes, um, having to do with the exciting new science of gravitational wave astronomy with detectors like LIGO and the uh, soon to be uh, gravitational wave detectors in space that um, are really now just the beginning of this exciting new field where we detect ripples in the fabric of space time coming so far from the in spirals and mergers of binary systems, um, mostly so far composed of what we think are black holes and uh, sometimes neutron stars as well. But this new science, which I won't really be talking about much at all, <laughs> um, but this new science requires very accurate theoretical predictions for the dynamics of binary systems of compact objects such as black holes. And among the many ways that this can be approached, for example, as opposed to intense full numerical simulations of Einstein's equations for a binary black hole system, weak field perturbation theory is a crucial input for these theoretical predictions to be able to cover the whole parameter space. And this comes in to meet the amplitudes picture in that doing perturbation theory in, in classical physics is, is, is still difficult. And it turns out we have seen recently that amplitudes technology so originating from quantum field theories is demonstrating its potential to surpass traditional classical methods in solving the two body problem. So keeping that in mind, I'm not actually going to say much else about gravitational waves, but about solving the binary spinning black hole problem. Let's think briefly about some of the scales that are involved. So say here I'm picturing two black holes with say a horizon and a spin. So in fact, my, my talk is going to be focusing very much on the effects of the spin of the black holes, which is a big complication, but a very interesting and very necessary one for the applications. So the spin angular momentum, the S here, is related to a very important quantity, this A parameter. So for each black hole, the, the spin divided by the mass when the speed of light equals one gives you the so-called ring radius A. So actually this parameter A spin over mass is measuring the radius of the ring singularity of the black hole, which usually is hidden behind the horizon of the black hole unless uh, a is bigger than gm, in which case actually we have a naked singularity. Keeping that in mind, oh dear. Well, the traditional and then so we have say speed of relative speed between the two black holes and the distance are separating them. That gives us some scales and the traditional way to perturbatively approach solving the binary black hole problem is the post Newtonian method where we have these, the small parameter gm over r measuring the field strength, we assume that's small. And if this system is in a bound orbit, that's gonna be of the same order as the velocity squared. And if the black holes are not naked singularities, if they're actually sub extremal black holes, that will also be the same order as the ring radius or the rescaled spin over 
the distance. So all three of these small parameters are of the same order and we assume we do perturbation theory there. That's the post-Newtonian approach. That's the traditional approach here. I've listed some reviews that review that scheme and an alternative is to imagine at least in principle, I can say I have weak fields, but relativistic speeds. And this one is a bit weirder, but I could also treat this expansion in the spin, essentially, or the ring radius, I could also treat that small parameter as independent and maybe even work to all orders in that parameter, to all orders in the spin, while still trying to do a weak field expansion. So this gets a bit strange, again, because if I do that technically, actually, then I'm not talking about a black hole anymore. I'm formally in the naked singularity regime, but maybe that's okay, at least mathematically, formally. We can do that. And so this scheme can be called the post-Minkowskian approximation, where we assume weak fields, basically an expansion in G, but relativistic, unconstrained speeds, and maybe also working to all orders in the spin. And in the interest of time, there has been some recent significant progress in, in getting new results for the interactions of black holes in this post-Minkowskian approximation, some of which are reviewed here, without spin going up to G cubed or the two loop level, and some progress with spins at the order G squared or one loop or second post-Minkowskian level, but Something which I find very interesting and have been involved with is the fact that at linear order in G, we really do seem to be able to make sense of working to all orders in the spin of the black hole and also to all orders in the velocity. And I want to next tell you a bit about that and wonder about the prospect of doing the same thing at higher orders in perturbation theory. So a Kerr black hole, a spinning black hole, um, one famous way to describe it is in this, so the metric of a Kerr black hole can be written in the Kerr shield form in terms of a very special null vector L. Here I'm showing you a picture of what this null congruence looks like. I don't have time to explain it, but some work that I was involved in um, a few years ago pointed out a very interesting structure related to what one might call the linearized Kerr metric, which can be written in this very simple form. So the, this linearization differs from the exact Kerr metric in Kerr shield form by something that looks like a linearized gauge transformation. I'll come back to that later, I hope, if I have time doesn't matter at linear order. So at linear order, this metric perturbation has the form of a very simple exponential of spin times derivative operator acting on, so if this became just the identity, this would be the linearized Schwarzschild metric with two copies of the four velocity and then this one over R potential. That's linearized Schwarzschild. You add in this exponential of spin times derivative, and that turns it into the linearized Kerr or spinning black hole metric at linear order. And a very interesting story has developed concerning the treatment of an effective Kerr black hole in linearized gravity. So a linearized Kerr black hole. We just briefly looked at one way to write the linearized metric associated with this object. And also still on the classical side, there's a direct relationship between that metric perturbation and an effective action, which then on the one hand encodes that linear field and also encodes the linear response to external fields. So this kind of effective action can start allowing us to take two of these objects and let them interact with each other and the linear gravitational field, including the full tower of spin-induced multiple moments, and 
a particular form of, of an effective action principle that encoded these things, and in particular this field, was first written down by Levy and Steinhoff in this paper. And I'm not showing you exactly that action principle. Um, it involves some very important kinematical terms, but one might say that the dynamics can be summarized by an effective dynamical mass shell constraint, which looks like this. And the important point here, so of course I'm skipping many details, but there are couplings between this A is the spin vector, essentially the same thing we had here. A again is the ring radius, it's a spin divided by mass, but this vector it's like the Pauli-Lubansky spin vector divided by mass. And then this four velocity of the black hole contracted into the Riemann tensor in this way. And more and more covariant derivatives of the Riemann tensor with more and more powers of spin. This infinite sum of couplings, it turns out these are multipole couplings. We'll see more about that in a moment as already written down here is equivalent to this linearized field. And then we're neglecting here higher order terms, but now finally back to the amplitude story. It turned out that um, a few years ago, this is obviously the wrong archive number. I'm sorry, that's the same as this, but there was a paper by Arkani Hamed, Huang and Huang, where they were looking at scattering amplitudes for massive, and one of the many things they looked at in that paper was scattering amplitudes for massive spin S particles and a graviton. And they wrote down this three point amplitude, which they termed the minimal coupling amplitude, being the one which has a unique well-behaved high energy limit. And in that paper, they said nothing about black holes. But it turned out, as became clear later through many papers by now with these authors, for which I hope they'll forgive me, I didn't collect all the archive numbers, but down here are well over 10 papers amongst these many authors, which have different perspectives on the story of how this three-point amplitude for two massive spin S, one graviton, which was first written down by Arkani Hamed et al, having no thoughts of black holes as far as I know, um, it turns out that this minimal coupling, unique, well-behaved high energy limit three-point amplitude does correspond to black holes in a certain way, well, in a classical limit. And another part of this story, which goes back, as far as I know, the first time this was pointed out was by Vaidya that, so, so here I have, you know, an amplitude that is for a finite spin S. And if I consider finite spins, so say spin zero, I get in a classical limit, basically a point particle, a monopole. Um, in the gravitational multipole expansion, that monopole coupling is universal. It doesn't depend on the type of body under consideration. I go to spin half, say, so a, a massive spin half, a Dirac particle exchanging gravitons, it has a dipole or spin orbit coupling that is also universal in gravity. In, gra in the gravitational multipole expansion, the dynamics corresponding to the monopole and dipole levels is universal basically as a consequence of local Poincaré symmetry. But if I continue, if I go to a spin one particle, minimally coupled, um, exchanging gravitons with other things, it has a quadruple moment proportional to spin squared that very specifically matches the black hole quadruple moment. And as I keep so this was pointed out by Vaidya. As I keep going higher and higher in the quantum, spin, the spin quantum number, I get more and more multipoles of my classical particles. And if these quantum spinning particles are minimally coupled, then I get this specific matching to black holes. Justin, Justin? Yes. 
Um, we have a question. I think it could be useful once in a while to take a question on the fly. So yes, let's someone do unfortunately it. not identified with full name, Aslan has a question. Yeah, you like to unmute I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in this uh, amplitude, if we have uh, instead of graviton, we have uh, gluon, what will be the amplitude? I'm sorry, I did not understand. Um, could you repeat? Uh, yeah, if, uh, if in this amplitude we replace the graviton with one gluon, what will be the amplitude? Replace the graviton with? With a gluon. Or a blue one. Yeah. Okay, well, on my next slide, I'm going to replace it with a photon instead of a gluon. Um, and essentially, there's not much difference between the gluon and the photon. So, all right, w w one thing I didn't uh, focus on here yet is that in this amplitude, as written down by Arkani Ahmed, Huang and Huang. They're using uh, massive spinner helicity variables in their very nice notation that they developed in that paper, uh, which we're seeing here. And then there's this very important factor X, which depends on the spinners associated with the massless momentum and then an arbitrary reference spinner. So here in the graviton amplitude, we have a factor of x squared. And to answer your question about, so I think, well, first for photons, there is an analogous amplitude for photons. And apart from the couplings, which I've omitted in this proportionality, the only difference between the massive spin S guys exchanging meeting a graviton and the massive spin S guys meeting a photon is that it's x instead of x squared. If it was a gluon, you would have a color factor here. Um, but I think that's the only change. It would still be x instead of x squared for a gauge field. And so this, in this original, um, in this paper by Arkani Ahmed et al, they also talked about this, this photon versus graviton amplitudes and how there is what you might call a double copy structure in that there's simply x for photons and x squared for gravitons. I'm also pointing out here. Um, um, I have another question. If, yeah. uh, if this relation between two amplitude is with graviton and photon, it's consistent with the effective field theory in, in the Lagrangian? OK, so. Or, or you, we can't just derive this equation in the amplitude context. So in the paper by AHH, as I'll call them from now on, um, they did not look at Lagrangians or really field theories at all. And in fact, they wrote down this amplitude. Basically, you could say they bootstrapped it. Um, in an S matrix approach like context, um, like applying appropriate general principles, unitarity, locality, etc. You can parameterize the conceivable forms of amplitudes. And again, the, an important point here was to fix this unique answer for such a three point amplitude. I think I have it back on this slide they required a unique well-behaved high energy limit, which is very much like a massless limit. As these massive guys become massless, or at least as you go to that limit, there's a unique well-behaved amplitude. And that's this one. And that's the one that remarkably seems to correspond to black holes. We will hear, I believe, later today, we will hear more about the relationship of this story to field theories with Lagrangians for higher spin particles. Um, in the talk by Radu Ruiban, maybe also by Chashin Shen. Um, but for now, let's just say these amplitudes were handed down from above. 
above my head, let's say. And once people started playing with them, they found a remarkable coincidence that this unique minimal coupling amplitude corresponds to a linearized black hole. And then the in an, an interesting point I wanted to make here is that what is this thing to which this photon is coupling here? Is it it's some kind of spinning charge distribution? Well, as was discussed in this paper, the square root, so-called square root Kerr paper by Cunningham, Ed Huang, and O'Connell, um, it's an object, we'll just call it square root Kerr, um, which when it's all alone in flat space-time, it has this vector potential. You can see a very striking analogy kind of double copy relation here. But um, the simplest classical definition of what is this object is it is the electromagnetic field on flat space time obtained from the kern newman solution in general relativity. That is a charged spinning black hole where you take the mass, essentially, the gravitational mass of the black hole to zero at fixed ring radius and charge. That gives you uh, some very strange distribution of charge, which has a ring disk structure of radius A um, with this field, this gauge field, essentially. This object can, is called root Kerr. Um, and it is, in some sense, the single copy of this linearized Kerr black hole. So I'm quickly running out of time, but having amplitudes or even on the classical side, having this effective action kind of descriptions, which I've, again, I'm not giving you any details on this, but I want to highlight some things that you can do. And one thing is you can think about scattering two of these linearized black holes off of one another or scattering two of these root Kerr objects exchanging photons off of one another. And it can be done more generally, but an easy special case is this so-called aligned spin configuration where the spins are perpendicular to the initial plane of scattering, in which case it stays that way. So the scattering is confined to a plane and the spins are orthogonal to that plane and it, it stays that way. The complete picture of what's happening is given by this scattering angle chi, by which both bodies are scattered in the center of mass frame and going either via a classical effective action approach or directly via the amplitudes and an iconal approach, which again, I'm not giving any details, but you can see it in some of the references I've mentioned you get these amazingly simple answers for the scattering angle for this scattering of two spinning black holes in the gravitational case with their each ring radius there or two of these root Kerr objects exchanging photons. And even here in the classical context, you see this remarkably simple double copy like structure where in fact, it's interesting to point out that in this answer for the scattering angle, these two terms could be said to directly correspond to the two different helicities of the exchanged graviton. And another interesting point here is to think about this smooth massless limit, which both of these answers have. Essentially, when the V goes to one or V goes to C, one of these two terms disappears and you have only one helicity of the exchanged graviton or photon contributing, um, which is an interesting point, but perhaps more interestingly for us for the near future is that this massless limit or ultra relativistic limit, the speed goes to the speed of light, the relative speed at infinity, I forgot to define this up here. This limit exists and it's smooth. And so this is a special case that I'm emphasizing this aligned spin scattering, but at tree level, 
at the one graviton or photon exchange level. This can be done more generally, and there's some work here which, which looks at that. So that was this tree level or one messenger exchange process. Can we go beyond this? Can we go to higher orders in perturbation theory, which even for the classical problem correspond to higher loops? And I think I need to finish up very quickly, but in the same paper by Arkani Hamed Huang and Huang, they also discussed the so-called minimally coupled Compton amplitudes, which correspond to those same unique minimally coupled three-point amplitudes. And they wrote down answers for those amplitudes, which were also basically bootstrapped, one could say, by some certain consistency requirements. Uh, in particular here, consistency with those three-point amplitudes and factorization, etc. But they were not valid for arbitrary spins, unlike those three-point amplitudes. Those three-point amplitudes really made sense for arbitrary little s spin quantum number. And you could then take the limit where that goes to infinity and get this full tower of multipoles. Whereas for this Compton amplitude, which enters the best way to look at the one loop process, this triangle unitarity cut up here, these amplitudes have problems for higher spins. For the photon case, when the spin of the massive guy goes above one, we get a spurious pole. And for the gravitational case, when the spin of the massive guy goes above two, we get a spurious pole. So my punchline, I guess, for this talk is, okay, we had this beautiful story at the level of three point amplitudes and tree level, right? And we really could go to arbitrary spins or all orders and spins. We seem to be going from the same inputs, which really all goes back to this Arconi Ahmed Huang Huang paper. We seem to be at a sticking point. And um, so I had two more content slides here. I'll just say very quickly. Already, if we don't try to go above spin two for the gravitational case, which as we saw back here, corresponds to going up to the fourth order in spin for the classical black hole, say, that was already giving new results as far as classical gravity was concerned which it wasn't clear whether they really corresponded to classical black holes in general relativity or not. And let me just say, there was this paper which addressed that question and seems to come very close, if not all the way to the answer that yes, um, that what came from that amplitude is matching things that can be obtained from independent classical calculations, which I don't have time to describe. And then, can we go beyond, say, to the fifth order and spin, et cetera? Um, let's just say attempts are underway to do that and in progress. And I think my time is definitely up. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Justin. Uh, you deserve a round of applause. So <laughs> thanks a lot. And uh, you're already uh, interrupted a, a couple of times, uh, but we can still have a few questions. There's one from Enrico Herman. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Justin. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have one question about your scattering angle formula. So formally, formally, there's a pole when you set A1 and plus A2 equals B. So the thing blows up. Yeah. Uh, do you have a physical interpretation of what that place is? Because it also shows up in the photon case. So if it were to really related to a naked singularity, I would have expected that it would be absent for the E and M case, no? Well, in a sense, this, I mean, so yeah, this pole is essentially the two rings are touching one another at this pole. Um, 
and you know, like, like think about the, even in the non-spinning case, so set all of these ring radii to zero, we have a pole at B equals zero, at impact parameter equals zero. That's definitely a physical pull, right? If, if, there's, if the impact parameter is zero, the two guys are going to hit one another. In this case, they're not points, they're extended into rings, but it seems reasonable to think that this is still a physical, I mean, essentially these two rings are hitting one another. Actually, more specifically, they're hitting one another at a tangent at this pole. Is there still a weak field? Like, is that still within the weak field approximation? Or I think your formula just breaks down at this point and you would have to resum, I guess. That is an excellent point. And we are far outside the domain of validity, yes. I mean, the formula really only makes sense when B is large. Definitely when B is large compared to G times the mass, but also actually when it's large compared to the ring radii. That is, that's a very good point. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, Nima had a question or with Drew? Oh, uh, hi there, Justin. Uh, can you, um, uh, you, you have to say it pretty quick uh, at the end there. Can you just uh, say it slightly more slowly? <laughs> uh, what's the, um, so what's, uh, uh, how do you deal with the fact that the Compton amplitudes are sort of sick for higher spin? So, this Compton amplitude, yeah, is sick for higher spin, but essentially what you can do, what was suggested by Uten and collaborators um, and partially implemented, we can just think about, okay, this, it's sick, but it can be cured. Like if we think about what are all the possible Comptons that are allowed by general principles, we can write down a huge ansatz. Oh, right? you make an ansatz, I see, I see, yeah. okay. A big ansatz, which has no spurious poles, uh -huh. um, but it has a ton of free parameters. And the next question is, like, how do we fix all of those free parameters to get a good black hole answer? There's a physical, I'm sure you guys have, have been uh, thinking about this, but there's kind of a physical uh, thing that you can try to do, which is to include the excitations of the black holes, like quasi-normal modes or something, as, as right. other elementary particles. and have the decay involving the quasi-normal modes just be a new three particle coupling and, and, and so on. I'm sure you guys were thinking about that, but that, that, that would be a physical way of sort of curing the, uh, the Compton problem, because that's really what's happening, is that we're exchanging more things other than just the, the like, uh, uh, the uh, black hole. But, yeah. Right. We are thinking along those lines, but I think there's still a long way to go. Although, I, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, David, you had a question also? Um, yeah, actually, I had a trio of questions, so let me just uh, pose them. Um, first of all, what is the interpretation? What can you just remind us what the singularity theorems say about this, these ring singularities, and uh, what's their interpretation in the square root of Kerr uh, situation? Well, I mean, the singularity theorems tell us that we should never see these singularities. They should always be hidden behind a horizon. I want to, I mean, like cosmic censorship says that in physical reality, most likely these singular, these ring singularity is always hidden behind the horizon. Um, because there was a hint uh, in your talk that you're not 100% uh, well, be believing that. It's just that mathematically, um, one can think, you know, it, in this story at tree level or at the three point level, we're basically considering linearized gravity and there is no horizon there. And we really are seeing this linearized curve solution you could say it has this exposed naked ring singularity, um, which you can see because there is no horizon in linearized gravity. That's one possible thing to say in response to what you're saying. And, and so then you would say that, that actually the same thing would hold true in the square root of curve. Oh, I really right. shouldn't be thinking about that. 
Well, for square root of curve, which is an electromagnetic field in flat space time, right? Forget gravity, forget curved space time. Yeah, that is definitely a naked singularity. The, the current corresponding to this gauge field here is a ridiculously singular ring disk thing. Yeah. All right, Justin, I, th I think we got to stop the, the questions sure. here. Uh, thanks again very much. We give you an applause. Thank you. And uh, we set up.